In this episode, we interview online marketer and business owner Oliver Canton. Some of the topics we discuss are marketing, copywriting, selling online courses and coaching, and much, much more. Stay tuned. What's up, guys? Welcome back to The Jeremy Kirsten Show, where every episode we talk about business, entrepreneurship, investing, and personal growth. Today, we're going to be showing an interview that I did yesterday with Oliver Canton. He is an online marketer and business owner. Um, I found him on Twitter um, through the many, many tweets that he puts out every day um, regarding you know business, online marketing, um, just lifestyle entrepreneurship, and everything and so forth. Um, He's got a really good take on what it takes to kind of build a brand and do online marketing um, and, you know, kind of deciding which product and everything it is that you want to sell and kind of how uh, to go about starting that process. So I think there's a lot of uh, golden nuggets of information in this interview. I hope you find some value in it. If you do at any point, be sure to hit that like button. It helps out with the YouTube algorithm, helps us get to this video to other people. And uh, be sure to subscribe if you haven't already by hitting that subscribe button and go ahead and hit that notification bell so you can be notified each time we upload a new episode. Also, make sure to sign up for the newsletter that we're going to be putting out by clicking the link down in the description below. And with all that being said, let's go ahead and get into the interview. All right, guys. Well, today we have a special guest with us today. His name is Oliver Kin. Uh, he is um, a self-employed, uh, promotional marketer on, on Twitter, and I'm sure other many channels. Um, I'll kind of let him, I guess, describe himself to you. Oliver, if you could kind of set us up with, with you know, kind of a background of yourself and what you do now. Sure, thank you. Well, first of all, thank you for having me on. Jeremy. Absolutely. It's, uh, it's a pleasure. Um, so the people that do know I exist do know me from Twitter, um, I've been very active, my wife would say hyperactive, since April. I've been a lurker for a very long time, but I started becoming active in, in April. So if you know who I am, not that I'm especially famous or, or important, um, it would be from Twitter. Um, what I do for a living, I own two marketing heavy businesses. So one of them is a marketing agency where I help uh, various small businesses attract more high paying clients. I started in dental, primarily um, orthopedics, dental implants, things like that, the higher value procedures in, in dental. Um, some would call that lead generation. I call it appointment setting. Uh, so that's, that's my, my core business and how, how I became self-employed after 15 years in various sales and marketing roles in corporate is that that's how with that marketing agency. Um, and over the last eight months, I built another business with a partner, which is a health optimization coaching program with a pretty influential um, person in, in health. Mm -hmm. And so this is another, you know, online business. The, it's a private coaching relationship that people get from a health perspective. So beyond just fat loss and muscle, where were they going? towards health optimization, health markers, uh, cholesterol, testosterone, et cetera. So, you know, a more holistic uh, approach to coaching. And we focus on sustainability, right? There, there's a lot of things you could do to get quick results, right? Let's say you went full carnivore. Well, you would get good results. It's very effective. There's nothing wrong with that. In fact, it's, it's, it's great. The science shows that it's great but most people won't be a steak and eggs person for the rest of their life. So we, we go in and figure out what is the 80, 20 approach. So that would be, you know, a short summary of, of what I do. Um, and my role in both is really marketing and I'm, I'm a copywriter by trick, meaning I, I write emails uh, and words that, you know, compel people to take a desired action. Yeah. I've, um, I've guess, got a lot of interest in that myself. Um, you know, I've, I've, I've been following guys such as yourself and, and, and many like you for, I don't know. I mean, now it's, it's, I guess years. Um, and I've heard a lot of different things about copywriting, you know, both from like project life mastery, Dan Locke. Um, and then, 
you know, just, just others. And uh, part of it almost seems scammy. I mean, I'm, I'm sure you kind of know sure. what I'm talking about. Sure. Um, and, and that's why I wanted to talk to you, someone who's doing yeah. it day and day and kind of just figure out like, you know, I don't know, you know, like how does one begin to, to start to develop the brand and, and, and write the copy? And is it something that you just have to kind of blindly do like, like blind faith, you know, and just trust that it works? <laughs> um, sure. or is it, is it something that, you know, you're, you're like, you're measuring, you know, I mean, it's just like, how do you know that it works? And, and I know it's a strange question because it's, it's like copies everywhere. Right. I mean, on, on, That's on, it. On, on the back of your cereal box, it's, it's copy. Um, but you know, like, like how do you begin to, to, to craft that message? So let, let me, let me unpack some, sure. some of that. There, there's yeah. a lot there and, and let's see if I can hit all the, all the notes here. So you used a, a great example. So copy is everywhere, right? So cop, copy for the, if you tell someone on the street, I'm a copywriter, 98% of them will think you work in the legal field and you do copyrights for, a product, a service, a business. So copywriting means, so writing and copywriting means salesmanship in print. But it doesn't necessarily mean you're directly saying, you know, how to lose 10 pounds in seven days without counting calories by now, right? Every, um, every word you select, you select is going to be based on a lot of research. So let's go deeper on the idea of everything is copywriting. So the copywriting that people are actually familiar with, and I think impacted most by are, as you said, so product descriptions, right? Um, I don't know how old your audience is. I don't know if they've watched Seinfeld, but a, a nice example here is the J Peterman catalog in Seinfeld that Elaine works for, for a number of seasons. So the way that a story is built around a raincoat, right? You could say polyester, uh, made in Paraguay, uh, forty nine ninety nine. Right, that's it. It's all true. Nothing wrong with that. Or you could build a story around. Uh, you know, I'm gonna make one up on the fly. Right, like picture yourself in London. Uh, you packed a light thin jacket in your suitcase, expecting rainy days. Um, it's an especially sunny week in London, and finally the rain comes on the eighth day, and you're thrilled to pull out your exceptionally comfortable light, um, you know, fashionable jacket. Uh, you pull it out, uh, you lean against a corner and you spot a pub and you walk to the pub and you know, I, I could keep going there, but I'm building a, I just made up this story, right? A, yeah. About that thing. So we're evoking the emotions about that product. And Another example done, would be, yeah, go, go ahead. Sorry. Oh, oh, I was going to say, and that's done through storytelling. That, that, so storytelling is a big part. And um, I'll just build on, on, on that idea. So that copywriting is everywhere. Right. So, um, I wouldn't go as far as saying a movie screenplay is copywriting, but the trailer, the voiceover in the trailer and the way you assemble the different pieces to build the trailer, um, you're telling a different story. Sometimes they tell a different story than the actual movie, right? Yeah. yeah. And you'll get 10 explosions in a trailer making you feel like it's an action packed thriller. And really they just sh showed the same thing 10 times that happens once for two seconds in the movie. The voiceover is a political speech. So a speech writer, um, is definitely a copyright, right? If I just tell you, Jeremy, when you elect me, I will raise GDP from 2.1 to 2.2%. People in the third tax bracket will go from 47.2 to 41.9. You don't know what the hell I'm talking about, right? If you can, that's why politicians always say, you know, and now, you know, I met Amy in Iowa. And Amy is a mother of two and la di da di da, right? So yeah. that's, that's also copywriting. And then the last thing, you, you talked about cereal. So if you look at, especially things that are either positioned as really healthy, like a vegan packaged product, which may or may not be really healthy. I don't want to, you know, get too sidetracked there, but, you know, they'll tell a story. They'll tell you what the product doesn't contain, right? They'll make a big deal out of, like, for example, something with agave syrup. For the record, agave syrup is sugar. It, it's not really better than sugar. But people will say, without sugar or syrup comes from the rainforest and, and la di da, right? And then something like Cheerios, well, one of the most impactful things on a box of Cheerios, they have a tag that says heart healthy. Now, this is a combination of lobbying and a lot of, of manipulation. They're definitely not heart healthy for the record. Uh, but 
you know, it's right there on the box or even gluten-free, right? Some, there's new regulation in different places, but some things like you'll see something that has no grain, but they'll say gluten-free and people are like, ooh, gluten-free, right? My vitamin water is gluten-free. Okay. I don't know how you would get the gluten, but <laughs> so, you know, everything, pretty much every communication from organization to individual or, or B2B is built on copywriting, whether or not it's deliberate, what you're doing is copywriting. And the secret to good copy isn't the words that you choose. Obviously, in a perfect world, you know, it's, it's well crafted, uh, it's concise, but it's more copywriting is more about knowing who your customer avatar or buyer persona is, right? I, I did a, a quick live yesterday on Twitter talking about if I just tell you men 18 to 22 go, that's nothing, right? Like unless you're such a mass market product, maybe if you give me Powerade and men 18 to 22 and give me nothing else, okay, I can sell them Powerade. But anything that's a little bit more specialized, you need to know what are people's pains? What are people's insecurities? What is the gap between their current self and desired self? And um, what do they relate to? You know, who are the heroes? Who are their enemies? If you think of beyond, beyond meat, right? To go back to nutrition, I, I would like those examples. Well, when you buy beyond meat, you're saying that you have maybe an environmental concern, maybe an animal treatment concern, and, and it's a whole thing, right? It's not just the absence of meat, it's all those underlying things. So you channel the emotions, you talked on storytelling. So ideally you channel the emotions, you craft a story, and then a good copywriter will have a lot of inspiration. So the best copywriter ever, his name is Gene Schwartz, the author of Breakthrough Advertising. Okay. He would say, copywriting is not about writing, it's about research and assembly. So if I write something net new, I'm going to go to my swipe file and I can find inspiration inside that niche, but also outside of it. Now explain to people what a swipe file is. I've only heard that term a few times. Again, I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit newer yeah. in the world of marketing, but, but I have heard it. So explain to people that, that don't know. Anything. Yeah, it, it, it sounds fancy. And actually uh, I just changed laptops and my own swipe file is a disaster. So I'm working on improving it. It simply means, uh, and you were talking about measuring. So we, we can tackle both those things, right? So a swipe file means a collection of successful or maybe not successful that you want to stay away from items, right? So if you think of what you're doing, maybe you have a product description swipe file. Maybe you have an email subject line description swipe file. Maybe you have a headline description, right? Um, and that can come from magazines. I was tweeting about the National Enquirer, right? They do great headlines. I'm not saying you should get your information in National Enquirer, but you can, you can learn a lot from how they, um, how they position what they're doing. Uh, Buzzfeed, right, is another great example. Um, obviously, for online marketers, you can look at all active Facebook ads. There's a Facebook ad library and an easy trick there. If an ad has been running for six months, for a year, for two years, you know it's successful. If it wasn't good, they would have turned it off, you know, after a week or two weeks. So a swipe file is just a collection. Um, you know, designers have that. I think everyone has some kind of inspo, right? Whether it's a board. Uh, in our case, it's a collection of words in different ways, maybe different calls to action. And after you do research and you figure out who your buyer is or who your various buyer personas are, well, you want to go to your swipe file and see what is my starting point. And then from that starting point, you can assemble different pieces. And then really you're researching, assembling a draft, and then you're editing into something coherent. That's what you're really doing. You're rarely writing from zero. So a lot of your customers, clients, um, would you say that the majority of them are coming to you with, you know, asking for your help based on what they see you doing on Twitter and things like that? Or are you doing a lot of outreach going to them and trying to obtain clients? That, that's a good example. So I, I started without a quote unquote personal brand. Uh, it sounds quite douchey to say personal brand. So, you know, let's put a bit of salt in that, uh, in that water. Uh, sure. So I, I started with outreach, uh, Again, if, if part of what you're doing involves copy, right? And if you are working as a freelancer, as an agency, then again, whether or not you call yourself a copywriter, you are using copywriting to outreach, whether it's an email, what you're saying on the phone, if you're cold calling, 
what are you telling people in person if you're knocking on doors? If you're running ads to, to drive businesses or drive discovery calls, again, it's copywriting. So in my case, I, prim I primarily grew through paid ads because I started my agency. I was 32 years old. I, was, I had been working for 15 years. So I, you know, spending a few thousand dollars on ads wasn't a big deal. But you know, many, many people are starting out younger in a different capital position. So outreach works, right? Again, whether it's cold calling, whether it's cold email, uh, sliding in people's DMs, uh, it does work. It's a, it's a copywriting exercise. If you're telling people a long, boring story, well, nothing's gonna happen. If you can hit the right notes and get people to engage, then you know your copy is working. And a note on, on calling, right? Like a lot of people, I think especially younger people, uh, I'm not bashing uh, the younger generation. I actually am very inspired by, by Zoomers and, and younger people. Uh, but if you can get over the scary telephone, right? If you can actually call people, especially in your area, right? If I'm in, I'll just say Boston, and I've got a Boston area code, and I decide, okay, I want to try working with chiropractors, right? I want to do Facebook ads for chiropractors. If I call them from, from the area code, maybe they don't pick up. Maybe I send them an email, say, hey, I called you from that number. Maybe you slide in their DMs. Maybe you go knock on the door. Uh, you can get, uh, at minimum, someone who will let you work with them for a small amount or for free in the short term to validate your skills, to validate what you're doing build up your confidence and experience, and then you can, you can build a real business pretty quickly. What's a typical charge? I mean, as I've heard a lot about, I don't know, a thousand dollars a month, things like that from clients that'll, that'll pay you to do, you know, SEO services or, or lead generation, sure. things like that. Is that pretty general or can we think uh, about no, much, you know, much higher or lower or what? There's a tremendous amount of, of variance in what people charge. The, the biggest difference, if you're selling a specific skill, right? So let, let's take the extreme. So let's say you go on Fiverr, on Upwork, and there's other ones on the job boards, right? Well, by definition, you're, commodized, uh, you're becoming a commodity, right? You're saying, I am one of 600 copywriters, of 600 media buyers, of 5,000 designers, whatever the case may be. And then you're competing on price. And then it might be less than you said. It might be seven bucks an hour, 10 bucks an hour, 12 bucks an hour. Then you've got, yeah, people that are starting out. The other pitfall to look out for is just selling the thing, right? So social media marketing or SEO. And um, that's where, you know, the figure you, you, you quoted, 500 bucks, 1,000 bucks, um, that might work. A better way to think about this is what problem are you actually solving for people, right? SEO is not the goal. The goal is to have people discover you. So people take the desired action, right? Book an appointment, buy a product, uh, buy a book, whatever the case may be. So if you're, if you're telling people, you know, I have a marketing system, you find a unique name for your marketing system that will drive an incremental 20% of people to your website. And I expect, so back, going back to measurement, so, you know, I can drive more eyeballs to what you're doing and I will improve the words and the delivery and what you've got on the page to increase conversion. Conversion might simply mean opting into email marketing, or it could mean taking an action right now, right? So if mm. you're doing that, and then you say, okay, well, I've worked with, you know, let's take, I was talking about chiropractors. So, you know, you're a chiropractor right now, people go on your website and they need to call you. What if we created a page that demonstrated the kind of people that you've helped, the kind of results that they got. People could book a free consult on Zoom or on the phone. They do that for free. You give them 15 minutes of your time, you do a free diagnosis exploration session. And then instead of saying, hey, come on down for a $60 session, we, we create a few different packages. If you're, maybe you're a, and I'm, I'm guessing here, I don't know this area, but let's say, um, you know, you are a mother with a newborn, Maybe you have a specific type of pain or area of, of concern. Well, we have a package for you. Uh, over the next six weeks, we'll take care of ABC. And that's a nice package. It's only $400. And you can book anytime you want. And you can book online. Right? So we've just invented something with six or seven appointments instead of a one-time thing. I see. I see. And then you can charge more. I'll, I'll just, sorry to interrupt you. I'll, then if you're doing something like this, then, you know, sky's the limit. Maybe you're charging 3000, maybe you're charging 5000, maybe you're charging 10,000 because you're creating a lot more value. Yeah. Yeah. 
Um, I guess let's talk about the second company that you're kind of involved with. Um, I forget his name at the moment. Is it is it P Magnum? P Magnum. The, the, yeah. The, so yeah. So I'll I'll share that. So I, yeah. It will be it will be a reveal. So I I've never said publicly uh, who my partner is, but why why not? So my my partner yeah is is Petey Mangan. Uh, he is a 65 year old former clinical microbiologist turned health coach. He's the author of uh, of a dozen books, and last year. Um, after working with him on, on books and courses, uh, we partnered to create a coaching program. So I, I co-own and, and run um, this coaching program. And this is the business I was talking about in the beginning, where we, we help people achieve their health goals. And most importantly, you know, keep the progress and continue making progress. So uh, this is you know, a very modern type of business where it's, it's all online. So people get a relationship with a highly qualified coach. They get a personalized approach. They get customized fitness, customized nutrition. Uh, PD, as a microbiologist, he can look at people's lab work, and lipid panels, interpret their data, give them guidance. And the big lens, right, is sustainability and, and common sense. So I'll give you an example, right? So in, in health, the kind of person that is health conscious is often doing a lot of things that are either not very effective or diminishing returns. So if you're taking 25 different supplements, you're working out six days uh, every week, you are probably at 90, you know, you're probably past the 95% uh, effective and efficient. And so we can give you clarity on what actually matters and save you a bunch of time on exercise and a bunch of money on, on supplements. So these, these these programs that you're that, that that this company has put together, and you, like I know you mentioned that they're personalized and things like that. So we're we're definitely not talking about just some video course or something like that, right? We're not. No, no. It, it's really a coaching relationship. So meaning, uh, I'm trying to find a a parallel that your your audience would uh, would know. I mean, in a way, right? So he's not a medical doctor, but it's 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 similar to telemedicine, right? So if you were to work with someone or or a nutritionist, right? Again, he, he's not a, a frankly most of the not most many of the medical doctors and nutritionists adhere to the the food pyramid, which is just not helpful. It was written by by lobbyists, but it, it's a relationship where. Um, no, it's not just a book. It's not just a course. It's not just videos. It's really just like we're doing now, right? So it, it's a relationship with someone to give them clarity on what actually matters, right? And um, I'll give you one example. Let's say you need to lose 30 pounds. Nutrition is going to be 90% of the game. Exercise is good to preserve your muscle to make sure you don't lose muscle. You don't want to do indiscriminate weight loss. You want to target fat loss. At minimum, you want to keep your muscle mass. And ideally, you want to construct some new muscle. So focusing on nutrition is the most important thing. And then just the right dose of exercise. So first, you know, you don't need to spend all your time and you can get results a lot faster and in less time than, than many approaches would, would preach. And then there's also the risk of um, having less energy. If you don't do any exercise, you'll find yourself with less energy. If you do a lot of exercise, there's a good chance you'll find yourself also with less energy. And the last thing is injury. If you do a lot of volume, right? The metaphor I always use is if you drive 30 minutes each direction, five days a week, that is five hours of driving. If you could do it instead twice a week, well, that's two hours of driving. So we've shaved your car risk accident by 80%. So the same is true in the gym. If you go to the gym less, you do things well, you keep your, your ego out of it. You don't try to lift the heaviest weight. You can achieve great results, mitigate your injury risk. And, uh, you know, and in parallel, lose fat. Uh, for context, the audience is a bit older. So we're not talking about 22 year olds. We're talking about, you know, probably 40, 40 to 55, 80% uh, men uh, as an audience. A lot of the marketing towards that program there, is that through paid ads or are you doing other types of marketing, reaching out, things like that? Or are you just solely trying yeah. to rely on the ads and, and funnels and things of that nature? So there are no paid ads at this point. Uh, it's just under uh, a year old, this program. And everything is done organically through his audience on Twitter and on email. 
Interesting. Yeah. I mean, I've always heard that emails, and I'm sure you probably agree with this, that the, the email is still one of the best marketing tools because, hey, I mean, everyone's using it. You don't change your email that often. Um, and, you know, if some of these platforms disappear or go down, you still have that ability to, you know, to, to, to reach out to these customers. Um, I guess some of the other things I wanted to talk about was just, you know, the, the, the business that you have from home where you're, you know, generating leads and reaching out to customers and things like that. How does one who's looking at, you know, Twitter or YouTube and, you know, they see a lot of make money online and at home type of things, but they're just sort of trying to get started. What is something that they need to do? And, you know, for me, for example, I want to maybe do like a sales course. Um, it would be probably a partial like video, but also, you know, the, 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 the copy there, just in case somebody wants to read it and, and not watch the video so much. Um, but, you know, I, you know, I'm not sure if it, if it needs to, to just be something that I create and then send traffic to through paid ads or, you know, just keep building the brand and, and, you know, sending sure. people that way or something like that. So how does someone kind of get started? Yeah. So, so a couple things, right? So I'll just start with everything works. Paid ads work, email marketing works, building an audience uh, on Twitter, on Facebook, on Instagram. I'm less familiar with TikTok and, you know, it may or may not get banned. Uh, YouTube, obviously you're on YouTube, um, SEO. So everything works. There's not one thing that I'm not going to tell you. Uh, paid ads are terrible. Organic is good. Everything works. It's all about the market. It's all about you know, your own strengths. If you're a one man operation, right? Or one woman operation, you probably won't be able to do SEO, paid ads, pump out, you know, 20 tweets, a bunch of Facebook posts, a blog post, three YouTube videos. So you, you've got to figure out where does your market live? To your point, I'll just build on the email marketing thing that you said, um, owning your audience, depending on what you're doing, what you're selling. Um, if you're doing a, a higher ticket offer, meaning, something that is, you know, uh, there's not one clear definition, but let's say several hundred dollars to several thousand dollars, right? You could send paid traffic to something that's a $29 product, uh, whether it's an info product or a physical product, and, and you'll get, you know, with, with the right marketing message, the right positioning, uh, you know, the right trust and congruency on the site, right? Something like e-com, you can sell, right? Some people are making an absolute killing doing that. Um, the same is true for, for Amazon uh, as well, if you're an e-com. So everything works. It's a matter of what are you trying to achieve? So, so let's take your example of a sales course. So first of all, the first question is, are we talking about an information product or are we talking about a coaching program? Yeah, and I think that that's probably something that you would, would, would agree on is that clarity is probably the first thing you mm -hmm. gotta get, right? Are, like what, what exactly are you building? And, and to who is it targeted to? So, yeah. I, you know, I guess the first thing would probably be, I guess, for example, let's just start with info product. Sure. So then you want to say, okay, so, so you, you want something that people can consume on their own time, something that you can, and I'll, I'll quote Jack Butcher from Visualize Value, right? So the mindset then is build once, sell twice. And twice is modest. It's just a, you know, it's a metaphor. So again, sales is a huge thing, right? There are people selling aircraft carriers to the military and there are people selling lemonade on the street corner. So I'm assuming you're not doing either of those things. You're somewhere in the middle. So you've got B2C sales, you've got B2B sales, you've got in person, you've got on the phone, uh, you've got uh, direct mail. There's so many things, but let, let's assume, are, are we talking phone sales primarily? Um, probably more like like the face-to-face -face type sales or, okay. or the, the uh, phone sales. Phone sales. So, so let, again, we'll, we'll do, in, in a real world scenario, obviously I would do a lot, of, a lot more research, but ju just for fun, right? To give people some, mm -hmm. some ideas. So, okay. So what, who am I and what are my problems? So if I want to learn phone sales or in-person sales, we'll say, so I'm going to assume this is a B2B type of sale, right? Maybe I want to be a salesperson in technology to sell software, uh, maybe hardware to organizations. You know, if you're familiar with the show, The Office, maybe you want to become a paper salesman, right? Something, something like that. Let's just lump that in together. Okay. So 
So what are my problems? So if you think about it, the first thing is, is sales the right job for me? Then it's, how do I get a job in sales? So how do I find organizations to actually apply to? Then it's, how do I create my resume, my cover letter, my LinkedIn uh, uh, personality, et cetera. Then how do I nail the interview? Then what if um, I start the job and I don't have any guidance? Right. So how, what, what would be the kind of behaviors and tracking and habits that I need to have? And then, you know, how do I generate leads? And then how do I have a relationship with these leads? And how do I maybe shorten my sales cycle? And then what do I actually say? And then one thing that I personally don't agree with to a large degree is objections. I think when you're handling objections, something has gone wrong in general. I think that is not the right sales psychology. But let's just assume that people want that. So, you know, addressing objections. And then you'll have, you know, loyalty, keeping clients uh, active. And then you'll have wallet share to sell people more stuff, right? So I, I, I can't even remember all the things I said, but let's say I broke it down into 10 buckets. So you want to see what, what people have what problems, what other offers exist in the marketplace, what areas do you feel confident that you can help people uh, build on? And then I would try with one of those things, right? Maybe it's getting, you know, finding your first sales jobs and your first sales job. And then the first couple of buckets or, or three buckets, you could create a product that way. Maybe you would do a free, uh, a freebie or a lead magnet to get people on an email list and uh, indoctrinate them into your worldview and then start showing them offers, right? Maybe it's a $49 ebook. Maybe it's a $199 video course, whatever the case may be. And then you can work on ascending people to different levels up to and including a private coaching program. I know you're uh, having some tech, some tech difficulties. Yeah, is, yes, that, is that okay? Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Sorry. Just trying to get it together here. That's okay. <clears throat> so, you know, you, you, you see things can very quickly be broken down and then further analyzed, right? And ultimately it all goes back to who is this person? What am I doing to help them, right? The, the size of the problem you're solving tends to correlate or even be in direct proportion to how much you're getting paid. So if you help someone go from a customer service job to a sales job, let's say they go from 35,000 to 80,000, right? Well, the value you're creating is immense, right? Like that can change someone's life. If you had the right messaging, the right marketing, and the right offer, the right credibility, in theory, that could be worth $10,000, right? If you're, if you're showing me, I will show you the step-by-step -step approach to find who to work with how to get an interview, how to nail the interview, how to beat my quota, and then how to be a rock star. You know, I mean, that, that could be worth millions of dollars in lifetime earning. Yeah, so basically you're st talking about and, and, and recommending to a client starting from, from day one scratch, like they had no idea about any aspect of, you know, the business or the job or, you know, whatever it is that, that you are teaching. Well, the, the idea is, what part of the market is underserved? What part of the market are you familiar with? Right? Like if you're like, for example, so I've worked in sales for a lot of my life. And um, so I could, I could help you get ready to find a sales job, get a sales job, perform well and get promoted to sales manager. If you're telling me um, you're selling a brand new product, um, a new piece of technology that requires a $50 million investment, for someone to get started with. I don't know what that, you know, I don't know anything about that. So I'm not the right person. That's a super niche market. Maybe you could find a partner and do that, right? But it's about what specific problems are you solving for people? And what are the emotions associated to that? Like, what do they want to achieve, right? There's a difference between someone's stated goals. I want a new job. And why do they want a new job? It's not just for that fact, right? They want to provide more for their family. They want to improve their status. Maybe they want more freedom and location independence, obviously make more money, but why make more money, right? 
if I give you $10 million in a suitcase and it sits there, you're richer, but it, it hasn't done anything for you, right? So what do you want out of this? It's, it's always a matter of deconstructing what are the emotions and the real goals, right? The reasons why people buy or take an action have very little overlap between why they actually did what they did. Yeah, and I think again, to like what you were saying earlier, a lot of it is emotion-based. Um, so it's all emotion-based. Yeah, so, so, so when you can figure out early on their goals and a tie, you know, tie the, the, the goals to the emotions, um, I think that really helps out a whole lot. Uh, Oliver, tell us a little bit about kind of what you're doing before marketing and how sure. you got into marketing to begin with. Sure. So I was in, in sales and marketing my whole life. Um, my, my first actual sales job was door-to-door CPR uh, course selling, um, which uh, I did for a short time for a summer. Uh, when, when, you know, when, when you say door-to-door, you mean like residential door-to-door? Yeah, residential door-to-door. Wow. So, so, I had, you, so, you, so you go to homeowners and you tell them, what if your child started choking on something yeah, or whatever? Yeah. Yeah, basically. So, you know, you have a list of people. So it wasn't completely cold. Uh, there was a list. There was a, a call center that would call people before to say, hey, we'll be in your area that day and that, you know, between that time and that time. So, you know, you knock and say, hey, do, do you know about this specific thing that you were called about? Right. And then all of it is sales. Right. So, OK, well, are you going to answer the door? Are you going to trust that I can come sit at your kitchen table? Are you going to listen to what I have to say? You know, will you give me a few minutes uh, of your time to, to build on, to, for me to ask you questions, right? If I just walk in and say, hey, life is dangerous, sign here, probably won't work. But if, if you allow me to ask you some pain-based questions, right? So, you know, hey, do you, do you have a swimming pool? Do you have a young child? Do you have a pet? Uh, et cetera, et cetera, right? Do, you, do older relatives visit you? Then we can discover together that life has some risk. And you can mitigate some of that risk with various solutions. And um, one thing I remember is I would say, well, you know, I have the, the average ambulance gets here in, let's just say 19 minutes. If you can catch a heart attack in the first 10 minutes, whatever outcome happens. So that's why you should learn CPR, right? And then I'm, you know, you, you can go a lot more uh, intense and say, you could save a life. I wouldn't go that far. Uh, you know, I mean, I was 18 or 19. That was uh, even, even younger. That was, that was a long time ago, but you can get people to connect the dots in their head. And then that course was, I don't know, $200 maybe back then. So then you're, you're, you're allowing people to equate at one time $200 investment versus the ability to save a life, the confidence that they'll know what to do if it goes down. Right. And so that, that was one example. I primarily grew up in, uh, in call centers. So I was a salesperson. I was a sales trainer. I was a manager. Uh, and then I was a director of a call center. So I had 200 people uh, working with me um, doing telecom sales, primarily uh, customer service calls that would become sales calls, but also some, some more aggressive sales calls, calling people out, uh, trying to upgrade their packages. Um, and then the last part of my career was um, in, also in telecom, where um, I was the national marketing manager for residential telecom services for the biggest uh, telecom provider in Canada. Um, and I ran the 2018 Black Friday campaign uh, to, uh, you know, compel people to get or internet or TV uh, or phone. Uh, yes, the actual, you know, phone line, not cellular. And uh, that campaign, uh, you know, created tens of millions of dollars in, in value, uh, in incremental value for the organization. And my bonus was $18,000. So that was one of the big reasons why I was dabbling in entrepreneurship and different things. But after that, I figured, you know what, I, I captured 0.0000000001% of what I created. Um, I want to own what I'm doing because it doesn't make sense for me. So what kind of allowed you to make the switch as far as you're like, okay, I'm going to go do this. I'm, I'm going to work for myself. You know, where did you begin to develop your own, your own products? So, um, my own, I'm going to split that in two. So products and services are, are different, right? And um, I think the first thing is just exposure, right? So uh, if you go back 
four years, I didn't really know what online business was outside of tech startup. So I, I was involved in a startup as well uh, in 2014. Um, we raised we raised a quarter million dollars, but it didn't it didn't go anywhere. Um, but you know, it's just, it's exposure and what are your mental models, right? Like uh, to take an, an extreme example, if you grow up in a less privileged um, background, um, maybe you have a single mother, and you know the 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 richest or most successful person in your neighborhood is a plumber and nothing against plumbers. Plumbers can actually do very, very well, by the way. Uh, but, but then your model is okay. Well, I can work in retail. I can work in fast food. Maybe I can sell cars. Maybe I can do a trade, right? Like you just don't have that exposure. Now I was not uh, this unfortunate at all. I came from a middle-class family, but not very, uh, my parents were professors. So, Business was not really a thing that we discussed in, in my household. An uncle of mine had dry cleaners and I don't, I can't tell you how, but you know, 20 years ago, so I'm 35 now, 20 years ago, I got interested in tech and startups and, you know, starting to, to see that. So, so that was my model, right? So I knew, well, doing a startup, working for a startup, that's one way to do something different than a conventional job. Um, a friend of mine, explained what drop shipping was, right? So e-commerce, meaning you're, you don't hold inventory, you're, you're selling products, taking orders, and then fulfilling through uh, something like Alibaba. So uh, that was in, in 16 or 17, uh, 2016 or 2017, I think 16. And so that just opened my eyes. I'm like, wow, okay, so what's going on here, right? And it took, I didn't realize in five seconds, uh, by the way, but eventually I realized, okay, this is copywriting, this is marketing, this is media buying, and this is really research and branding. So I looked at what I could do. Um, I, I didn't know I was a copywriter, but I did do a lot of writing, uh, you know, for, for work, um, creating sales scripts, for example. Um, I've done various things. I used to, I used to ghostwrite or, uh, or CEO's blog posts uh, in one of my jobs, for example. So, you know, I, I started with, with a leg up and I realized, okay, well, I mean, you know, okay, I discovered what copywriting actually was. I'm like, okay, this is what kind of what I've been doing, you know, without a system. And I tried a bunch of things. So I tried creating an info product uh, with my wife um, in the, in the health niche. Again, it was an IBS uh, prevention thing. We built a whole funnel, ads, a lead magnet, a landing page, a bunch of emails. We pumped out a thousand bucks in ads and it, it did nothing. It did nothing tried, at all? It, it did nothing at all. What do you think? That, uh, well, yeah, I mean, what do you think the problem was? Or do you want to come back to that? Um, yeah, you know, it's interesting. I, I, I like to actually go back. I, I think it was probably, it wasn't differentiated enough. So it was, hey, you have IBS, I have a problem, I have a solution for you. So I probably would have either increased the claim, meaning like it, it'll fix your problem faster and better than the other guy, or go higher up and say, do you feel bloated? Do you have digestion issues? Maybe helping people identify that they have IBS. So I was smack in the middle. I was like, the assumptions were, you know, you have IBS, you've tried different things and it didn't work, but I wasn't making a big crazy claim, which in reality, uh, and especially now knowing what I know, it's, it's a relatively simple problem to solve through lifestyle, relatively simple. Uh, I don't want to you know, say that you have IBS in five minutes, you can fix it but it is, it is reversible. So that, that's probably why. And then just to give more examples to people, right? So I did some freelance copywriting for, for a few bucks. I tried an e-commerce store and again, not enough research, not enough depth that didn't do anything either. Are we talking uh, about the I, drop shipping store at that point? Yeah. Yeah. So same thing, uh, create, created, created a store, pumped out ads, nothing happened. Um, I shouldn't say nothing happened. My work did not create any, any success. Um, and then I said, okay, like what, you know, what do I want to do? Um, I didn't want to just keep pumping ads into things without really knowing. So I said, okay, well, what do people need and what will people buy anyway? So I looked at my network and I looked at um, realtors. I looked at dentists. I looked at chiropractors and I found one dentist. So in my network, I found one dentist who had a practice, had subpar marketing, and I knew that I could do something better for him. So I said, look, give me an ad budget. So at that time he gave me $6,000 in, in an ad budget. And I created a whole new approach for him to drive leads, to get people to book appointments. And that resulted in 35,000 in revenue. So we 
you know, 5.5 X is his investment. That gave me confidence that I knew what I was doing. And then I went and pursued more, more dentists. I, I did a little bit of outreach, but I, I primarily did ads. So I built a lead magnet with a case study of what I did. I got a lot of people on the phone. I got a lot of no's, but I got enough yeses to quit my job. I like it. I like it. So a lot of those customers and clients now are on a type of residual payment system. Yes. Yeah. So they, they would be on a retainer. So uh, generally what I do for someone now, a new agency client, I would do a 90 day mandate. Um, generally it's about $10,000 to do that. And then an ongoing relationship between three and 5,000, depending on what I'm doing. When you say a 90 day mandate and a $10,000 minimum, that's kind of like, that's, that's the minimum that they have to, spend to get started with you yeah interesting interesting i like it um oliver i think i think i've asked pretty much everything i wanted to i mean unless there's something specific you want to share um i guess i'll just kind of close with like how can people find you online and, and find about find more about what you're doing sure so i've got uh twitter which is the main thing i'm sure you'll put that somewhere in the in the link so you can find that there and by the time that this airs, I will have a free Twitter course, uh, a two hour, very comprehensive course to build your, your Twitter audience. It's called Twitter uh, Influence. Um, actually, no, that's not true. Twitter Growth, Influence, and Monetization. And it goes much beyond Twitter. Uh, it helps you get content creation ideas, repurpose content to other platforms, graduate your audience to something like an email list. So it's very comprehensive. Uh, it's really about building, audi building an audience and building influence online. So it's Twitter centric to some degree, but the principles would apply to Facebook, to Instagram, to, to YouTube as well. So that, that's something that, that your audience might, uh, might enjoy. Uh, that will come out um, this coming weekend. So something like August 17th. Cool. Looking forward to it. Anything else? I think I'm good. I'm happy to uh, have the opportunity to, to blab at your audience for, for 45 minutes. And I hope you got a couple of insights. You know, yeah. bottom line for, for entrepreneurship, you've got to try different things, right? Few people will hit a home run the first time. It's about refining your process, measuring what you're doing. And, you know, sometimes getting mentorship, getting help, getting a course. Everything works. There's not one thing that's the best. There's not one thing that's bad. And um, it's about your skill set, what you want to do, what you want your life to look like, and um, you know how how much you're willing to to work to get started. That's really what it comes down to. I think anyone watching this, by definition, you have YouTube, you have the internet, you can figure something out, right? And success is different to different people. For some people, building a five thousand dollar per month business would be life changing, right? And it's really not that crazy or that hard. If you focus, we're just, just a little bit past the halfway point in 2020. I think most people listening to this, if they start now, if they focus on one skill, find a market to serve, probably a client business is the fastest way to get started. Um, you can get to that 5K before the end of the year and, and probably more if you actually start now and focus. Cool. I like it. Well, Guys, everyone, go check out Oliver Canton on Twitter. Check out his course on, on Twitter growth coming up. And uh, Oliver, man, thanks so much for coming on today. I really appreciate it. Um, I think we should do this again. I really like building the content and, and, and expertise around marketing and um, everything like that. So, again, appreciate it so much for coming on today. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. And I'm, I'd be happy to do part two if, uh, if the audience likes part one. Yeah, awesome, man. Well, Thank you again. Have a good rest of the week and uh, we'll talk soon. Thank you, Jeremy. Yes, sir. Take care. All right. You too. Bye-bye. Well, that was it, guys. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you gained some value out of that interview. I know I sure did. If you have any questions or comments, please leave them down in the comment section below. Be sure to check out Oliver Canton by visiting his Twitter profile with in the uh, link down in the description below. And also, if, again, if you didn't already, make sure you hit thumbs up, subscribe to the channel, and hit the notification bell. If you like this episode, be sure to check out other episodes we have on the channel by clicking right here and right here, and or just going to the channel homepage and viewing the rest of the videos. And until next time, guys, take care.